most welcome. This is our second virtual meeting. I'm so glad to host it. I'm so glad also to host the 100 Inspiring Women. This is one place where the women will inspire others, not only women. I'm surprised. I was actually extra surprised when others said, why are you excluding us? You also want to be inspired. That's why we left it open. Ideally, it was supposed to be within the 100 women, but others insisted that there's so much inspiration from your stories. And that is why we are hosting it open to everyone so that they can also learn benefit, transform their lives. And so that we are part of the change that is occurring in their lives. I'm so glad to host you. And my name is Winnie Kamuya, CEO, International Renaissance Center, the founder of WELL, that is Women in Leadership uh, Conferences and Forum in Africa. And this conference was founded in 2005 while I was in Swaziland. So my first speaker brings a lot of memories of where it all started. <laughs> so we have a long way that we've traveled. So. I'm so glad to host this second forum. And the speakers today are going to inspire, challenge you. They're going to bring some shift in your life. And if you are ready to be shifted, to be transformed, then you're in the right place today. Because today, the speakers have done things that are going to challenge and make you question yourself whether it's OK to remain in status quo or it's time to move forward. I'm in Nairobi and our speakers are from all over the continent. And I'm so glad that um, with technology now, distance is not an issue. Mm. We are connected and we are all together in one place from different parts of the continent. So welcome to everyone. Our first speaker, this is a lady I have much respect for, one of my mentors. We've known each other for, for quite some time long time it's actually i think more than 17 about 17 years when i first went to swaziland as a young mother with four month old baby going into a foreign country not knowing what i'll find there and when i think of do a panel when i'm doing like women's stuff i know i'm standing on the shoulders of a giant do a panel if I remember meeting her in Swaziland and when we were hosting our second Women in Leadership event, she was one person that held my hand as we did this mighty event. With Dua Pane on my side, I have great memories of meeting high profile leaders, learning from her about gender mainstreaming. I know she can't remember much about it, but we have it in a report that when we hosted the second Women in Leadership in Switzerland, it was about gender and development. And I'm sure some of the speakers we hear today might speak about some of those things. She was introducing to us gender mainstreaming. And you can imagine being in such a small country where most people would say, is there women in leadership? Does gender apply? And you will be able to learn a lot from Dua Pane, because Dua Pane is a feminist, a woman's rights and social justice leader, and a mentor. She works in areas of feminist gender and human rights and law, focusing on women human rights. She is creating spaces for feminist engagement and women's empowerment. She thrives in work that is gender transformative. She works in demanding accountability from duty bearers and promoting women's agency and bringing the change they seek to transform status quo. Her work is cross-generational in bringing about political, economic, social gender transformation for women in entirety. Do, met in 2006, while we were hosting the second Women in Leadership. You are still speaking about gender mainstreaming in terms of seeing women in those positions of leadership. And I want to believe that at that time, it is something you had had done for so long. And those are many years back. I want to ask you, 
where you started, what made you decide to go towards women empowerment? You being a lady and having studied law, what made you to see I need to get involved in women's issues? Thank you very much for that introduction and good afternoon to you, Winnie, and everybody in this space. Yes, my name is Du Apani. Unlike many people, unfortunately, I cannot quote a person that invited me into the movement or into thinking the way I think, but rather I can recall from as far back as when I was a child, when I, I'm from a family of girls with only one brother, where I used to question my mother why she would go on and on about my sister's transgressions. They would be 20 minutes late for preparing dinner. She would go on and on, but I'll say, but my brother was two hours late yesterday and you even caught him smoking, but you did not go on and on like that. And these things I saw even in church, I recall at Sunday school, uh, it was towards the end of the year. So we're going to, uh, the Sunday school uh, uh, children were going to come up with a play for the church. So we were auditioning for the prodigal son. And my mother and the other teacher, the Sunday school teachers were insisting on that it should be only the boys that audition. I said, no, it can't be. Uh, of course, this is not a son. A prodigal son is in the Bible, but now we're going, we're going to be role playing. The other teacher understood it, but my mother did not want to concede. So they decided to take it to the whole congregation to vote about it. And the congregation said, I had a point. And guess what? I'm the one that won the audition. And guess who I was uh, competing with? The current bishop of the Lutheran church, the person who became, who find, amongst others, who finally became the bishop of the church. So basically for me, I've al always observed the gap. But as I was observing the gap, of course, uh, uh, in, that is in the, the inequality, the insults, I would ask why are they by your mother's private parts, not your own parts or your father's? Then I went, in, I went to a girls' high school. I think that also molded me further. It uh, gave me confidence in believing in women. And when I went to university, the first year my classmates saw through me in law school that this one will make a, she's a different lawyer in the, in the making because even the judgments I was questioning so they named me Justice Schreiner. Justice Schreiner was a South African a Boer, a Boer judge who, who was always dissenting. But when, you, when it got to the next level, his decisions uh, would be upheld. So <laughs> by the time we got to second year, if a decision was to be taken, uh, mm -hmm. my fellow classmates, amongst whom is the current Chief Justice of Southland right now, would mm -hmm. say, let mm -hmm. us wait, for, uh, they would say, let us wait to drink from the fountain of just the, the dissenting judge, the lady mm -hmm. judge. Because mm -hmm. I would insist that I know I'm going against the grain, but give me a chance to state what, what my thought is, why, mm -hmm. so that that dissenting view we have it, it will inform us in future. It will be six months down the line, they, they will say we should have just listened to uh, to, to the dissenting judge. Then when I was in second year, came Alice Armstrong, a very strong feminist. Then now the rest is history. She became um, uh, my mentor. She's, back, she's one, if I could single out one founder of women in law, I would say it's her. I'm amongst the founders, but the person who had the vision and which we, we joined in were, mm -hmm. was her. So I was, I'm not one of those who say so and so, invited me to the movement ever since. Just, and of course, my, just, my just, sister just, fueled me. Mm. Just, just to, to understand, nobody invited you into the space of saying, I will do this. 
it is an observation you made and then you made a decision. Is that right? Yes, I made a decision to question, to fight. Sometimes mm -hmm. I didn't even know uh, where to go, like at the young age where I was questioning my mother and my sisters, of course, would say, go baby girl, go baby sister, because I was standing for the truth that they could not stand for themselves. Is it, could it be the reason why we find that women are not asking or going for those leadership position because then they can see they are not making the decision. Could it be the reason that women are holding back themselves from leadership positions? Yes, that is partly the problem. And also there is something that is killed in women at a very early age in socialization that it is your brother that can hold this position. And somehow, somewhat socialization manages because most of the time it is within the household and of course the school system, the uh, religious circle and so on. It, it manages to just kill something. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, so the voice that says I could stand up, I think it's rather too soft. It needs assistance from external to, for it to become a choir because of course, we know that women do have the skills, do have what it takes to be, say, in position of leadership, but they don't question. But we cannot go by that, and it's time to shift our ourselves into accepting that we can lead. So that decision, as a woman, where do you think women struggle with for them to allow themselves to be is seen in that position of, of leadership or to go after that leadership position? So, so what was the question? When do they struggle? I, I didn't get the question. Yeah, I'm saying for women, they struggle with that part. They don't see themselves as the leader, but they see the opportunity. What do you think is missing at the time they are seeing the opportunity and still questioning themselves why they should go into leadership? And what it's, maybe do they need okay, to it's, look at? Yes, it's a whole lot of things because we need to understand that a number of things intersect. It's just mm -hmm. not one force, one force pushing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's several uh, forces that uh, would, would be pushing uh, that make the woman say, "Okay, let me stay, let me stay in my, my corner. Let 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 let, let me not uh, come out." And mm -hmm. at that time, that is where having tools is important. And then one, one, one tool, one tool we can okay. we can maybe work or use. Okay, knowledge, for instance, is a tool. Yeah. Knowing that you have a right, right. to, yeah. if we, if we're standing, we're talking about to say for a political position you have a right to stand. So that, mm -hmm. that is a tool. But mm -hmm. another one would be solidarity, mm -hmm. knowing that there are others, there are other sisters, there are other uh, institutions, there are other uh, people, it, it might even be your own family, that are, that are behind you in that, mm -hmm. in, in that family. So knowing where you, 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 you'd go to. But in, uh, most importantly, it's a little girl that stays inside you. Self-worth, having self-worth is very, very important. So it, I, a tool that I could suggest for self-worth is if we can go, we can, if we can master ourselves, mm -hmm. we need to go through, uh, shall I say schools of self-mastery. By school, I mean, Get deep into yourself, know yourself, how you behave, wh why you behave in that way. What is it that you want to change about, your, uh, uh, about yourself? And mm -hmm. uh, which areas are you excelling in? And mm -hmm. which areas are you, uh, are you completely failing? And which ones are you fair? And then of course you want to improve and you, you, you look for that assistance on on how to improve. Mm. 
that's that's very very important to know because once you have the knowledge then you'll be able to understand and if you understand yourself properly that's why i think you are emphasizing on the knowledge and knowing more about yourself if you are self-aware then you will know where you're excelling you'll be able to position yourself without feeling that you don't deserve because i think that is one of the things that hold back women you have worked with a lot of women and they tell you how they struggle with dealing with those things. What are some of the things that come up like that bring that part of, I'm not worthy of that position? What are some of the things maybe that can help us? Okay, Maj majority of time is discouragement, the environment, the people around you, the partner mm -hmm. in particular, the intimate partner says, mm -hmm. ah, you can't do it. I mean, you are fine just here in the, in the household, you are coping, but mm -hmm. you, uh, you think you want to venture outside, you want to go uh, into employment, but there are no jobs these days and so mm -hmm. on. We, po political position, you and so on. So mm -hmm. that, that dissuades uh, uh, women a lot from mm -hmm. uh, coming out of their cocoon to, uh, to venture into what they don't know. But mm. another thing is uh, we have not invested in questioning because mm. out of questioning, we mm. can imagine. Mm. You see, if you can imagine, I like, mm -hmm. uh, if I were to sing a part of me that I love most, it's my brain. <laughs> because mm. I can, I'm able to imagine. You know, when I was in high school, I mm -hmm. used to write such essays that even the mm -hmm. teachers themselves, they would mm -hmm. mark the essay, they would mm -hmm. put it up on the pin board that it has won, it, it should be read by the others, but they themselves then sometimes call me aside to yeah. say, then you got yeah. lost. Like I, I remember one time, I think I was informed too, I'd written an essay where now we were in Moscow. Up to this day, I've never been to Moscow. I was lost in a train. My family yes. was looking for me and so on and so forth. Because I could just imagine what, what it's like there, what happens in a train and so on. But you know, born in Switzerland, there, there are no trains. I only knew a train from South Africa. Uh, they're not passing a train. I only knew a train from South Africa. So if we can invest in women being able to imagine, I think the problem is we are locked in this thing, the world which is not working for us. This world mm -hmm. is too toxic. It's patriarchal. We know that. It's mm -hmm. capitalist, neoliberal, all the things that, we, that don't work for us. So mm -hmm. to come out, to get a breather, you, first, we, we, we even have to imagine being outside that. So if we can give spaces for women to have time to think women have time uh, for women to have time to imagine because mm -hmm. women can most of the time they cannot imagine themselves doing something different than that i wake up at four ten to four is the latest i have to be up in the morning and go to bed and such a time and they all go through the same paces <laughs> Yeah, that is so, so interesting because I think maybe we don't use, utilize our brain, as you have said, to imagine ourselves in positions of leadership. And that is why we ignore the part that the possibility of what can, can happen in our lives. So we miss out on the opportunity because of that. And because we are not questioning as we should, then we don't see that we deserve to be there. So we will leave it and the men will just take it and feel they deserve. And this is not to say that it has stopped you from being a mother, a wife. You are still a mother, you're still a wife. You also have uh, children who have made boys, you have girls. It means we have to raise them in a way that they understand the space for every child. What can you say about like in terms of parenting? Does it stop you from ensuring if it's a girl, she knows that she should and she deserves to be able to stand up and speak for herself so that if an opportunity of leadership comes in, in her space, she can take it without feeling 
uh, she doesn't deserve or fearful about it. Okay, in terms of parenting, for me, I think the best is to do, uh, lead by, by example. Many a times we say to our children, uh, you can be anything you want to be. And mm -hmm. then I, 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 I'm able to be seven years, 17 years or whatever age you want me to be. I'm able to be there. Then I ask myself, if I can say you can be, and inside the child is asking, ah, so mm -hmm. do you want to be the cleaner that you are in our, in our home? Because you don't do anything, mommy. You are always cleaning. So in as much as you can say mm -hmm. what you want to impart, most importantly, I think what you do. So your children, because mm. children are very, very smart. We need to we need to know that. Because we yeah. adults, we say they should not consume alcohol, but yeah. we are the ones that are consuming alcohol. They should they should not be smoking. But we are saying some so that they yeah. emulate what we are doing. Yeah. So I will never ever, for instance, live in a violent relationship. Because mm -hmm. I always I, I believe that I don't want to be in it. And anyway. If I had an ounce of tolerating such, mm. I have not made provision for my daughter or my son to tolerate it. And therefore, even that ounce, if I had it, should, I should not utilize it. So mm -hmm. it's important to, to do the action as well. Yeah, well, that is so in, in, important. In fact, I think in the beginning, you talked about the environment. So if we are creating that environment where we are going to thrive, then we have to make sure it is the right environment so that we are not in an environment that is not conducive to what we actually want to be able to bring out. And that is really interesting because whatever you've been working towards in terms of empowering women and ensuring that they are stepping forward without fear is really something that has really worked and especially in terms of bringing forward the gender transformation and helping women to see themselves differently. I would want to ask as a lawyer, do you think it's been hard or do you think that uh, there are other challenges? Maybe if you were not a lawyer, you could not notice that. I think for me, it's as hard as challenging as for a woman from another uh, discipline. And also being a lawyer can have its own disadvantages, by the way, because in law school, you are, you are, told, you are taught certain things. You are taught, you are taught to believe in the ideology of the law. But where I am, I've long, long unlearned a lot of the things that I was taught in law school because they don't work for me, nor will they work for any woman. So I challenge, I question, I, I question them. Mm -hmm. So my best teacher, if you ask me, was not the, the lecturers at university, but the women out there, because I do a lot of research, their lived realities are what has taught me. So even, Yes, that, uh, in, in some instances, I had an advantage of that. I knew that, okay, excuse me, this is how I can uh, manipulate a certain, things, uh, certain things to work for women. This is how, how I can challenge. But on the other, it could have been a disadvantage because you have inhibitions of knowing uh, the protocol to follow, yet that protocol was not put there to make things flow, it was put there as an inhibitor. What I'm getting at, uh, mm -hmm. Madam Moderator, is that uh, the law itself is not just. Human rights themselves are not as inclusive as mm -hmm. we are made uh, to believe. As mm -hmm. women, we continue to fall through the, tr the, the cracks mm -hmm. of protection, even by a uh, we, we, we fall through the, the cracks of prote protection even by uh, human rights instruments or uh, our, uh, 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 our, the laws in our respective countries. 
the human rights instruments, if they were watertight, would not have be having CEDO, for instance, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which is our blueprint now. Because if you look back from 1948, uh, just after independence, uh, just after the end of the Second World War, um, mm. when when we had um, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, that declaration should be enough, but it's not enough. That is testament uh, to that the human rights themselves are not as strong as we are made to believe. That is why we have continued. To, to have other smaller Nyana ones, like the specific ones to employment, to uh, citizenship of uh, married women. And then finally, we had CEDO. And then with CEDO, even post CEDO, we have others on uh, peace and so on and so forth. Yeah. So what I want to, what I'm getting at is that questioning and looking at things in an intersectional manner helps us to move things forward, but we should be careful of governments and other agencies that steal from us. Now, throughout the world, come November 25, it's a, it's a, it's a chorus, 16 days of activism against women. It's a 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. It has even depoliticized violence against women. Mm -hmm. it, the violence against women is not be, uh, is no longer a focus. We are talking about gender-based violence. What is this gender-based violence? Who is violated? As I am as I am speaking, I know that every three seconds, this this is what happens to women in the globe, in my yeah. country, in the region. But yeah. now we are talking as though violence affects women and men in the same way. We yeah. have never said men are not affected. They kill each other. Yeah. Now you can see that the, the, there's this other one, like in Russia, this one we started a, a war. It's a man, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But who, who is affected by that war? Of course, the women. Yeah. And, the, and uh, I think, and I think one of the things that you you had said the origin of the gender is that women's role was seen as producers and they were that even being producers they are not recognized and maybe that is where there is the disconnect that you are talking about because women are not being seen like they fit somewhere and i think that's what you've been trying to say women fit somewhere and we need ourselves again to work on ourselves so that we can be able to come out and position ourselves and take up the roles do you think that maybe in the minds of the women, when they are asked to join those roles, they, they feel that that is too much of a, of a role? Yes, women do feel it's too much of a role. And to an extent, I agree, because there is no one size fits all. Let us use uh, uh, positions of uh, political positions as an example. Mm -hmm. The architecture of the parliaments I mean by architecture, both even in the physical and otherwise, was, is not conducive for women. So mm. that is why women detest to go to those places. So what is important is that we must change even the institutions. Uh, we must name and shame what is happening in the institutions. Because talking about parliaments, for instance, there's a lot of... Uh, sexual harassment in our, in our, in our parliaments. It doesn't matter where you can, there are studies and studies after that, yeah. I, I, about that. And when we look about, when we look at parliament, there is a certain level of patriarchy, violence in the way things, in the way things are done. Have we paid attention to a, work-life balance because at the end of the day the reality is that as women we raise our families i won't even say children we look after our families because even the sick in the, in the family they're mostly taken care of by women so do those spaces allow us to target our roles yeah 
no that that is key and we need to know because if we are going to change the status quo we have to be up and about if you are 23 of what do you think right now that time has passed what did you tell your self if I <laughs> you tell your younger self <laughs> now that you're wiser what did you tell your younger self that there are infinite opportunities but all is in the mind yes all is to do also with strategy mm -hmm. all is to do not just with self but with power with that my power alone is not good enough i'm stronger when i have power with others mm. so the power is very important do 23 year old do you better understand power you can yeah. challenge it uh, you can do whatever but uh, you, what you want at the end of the day is to get power with not power over and therefore solidarity is key to be with others yeah. that that is really nice because then if we don't know all these things and actually if we just put our mind into a limited space that is the space we'll operate so we need to know there is infinite opportunities and we need to work on that and take advantage without fear nothing will stop us what are some of the three things you'd give us as an advice today okay for me as an advice today i think what is very very what i believe is key is for women to look at not microeconomics, mm -hmm. but macro. We've done, there's just too much being done about mm -hmm. microeconomics, how you can improve that small stall of yours, that business, get a bit of a tender there. No. Rather, if we visit macroeconomics and start challenging the macroeconomics, I think we can release a lot of money from there that can impact on the lives of the, that, that can be a public good for lack of a better expression. By a public good, I mean something that will benefit everyone, something mm. that will release funds to go into health mm. so that you are not looking for a, a, a medical aid company, you are carrying a card and so on and so forth. Health is a right. We have a right to life, isn't it? So if we have a right to life, yeah. then why, can, why can't our health systems deliver yeah. that to us? If you, you are getting my, my point, it should, yeah. it should correspond. Likewise, there's a lot of a burden on women on childcare. If, why can't the state take over that there should be child care facilities everywhere in the communities, mm. uh, in, in workplaces, uh, and, and, and so on. Another thing that is so, I, I hope you get that on challenging, uh, yeah. The, yeah. looking at macroeconomics. Okay, the other thing, mm. uh, the, the, the other thing for me would be self-care. Mm. Uh, I just want to use an analogy of when you're in an airplane, they explain mm. that in the unlikely event of loss of cabin in air, there will be masks that will be thrown down. They insist that you must fit your own mask first. Please, please don't you don't <laughs> fit your child's <laughs> mask your own first. You understand? Um, yeah. Yeah. So likewise, mm. I think self-care is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And self-care, for me, at the bottom of self-care is perfume, and I love it very much. I better be understood. Mm -hmm. It's at the bottom. <laughs> Lipstick, those are at the bottom. I mean real self-care, making yeah. sure that you are getting the nutrition okay. that your body, not your child's body or your husband's body needs. Yeah. The one that is needed by your body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is 
you are get you are taking care of yourself because if you don't take care of yourself then mm -hmm. you can't take care of the of the others if you don't care take care of yourself you can't take care of the you, you, you can't take care of the movement and then another thing with me now is pursuit of happiness mm -hmm. i think happiness is very very important for individuals and co the collective if i am happy mm -hmm. uh, i want to see my family members happy i want to see other people happy and then there's peace there's happiness and there's peace there's contentment i mm -hmm. think those are the things to me that are important more important than how much one individual can uh, I don't know whether I miss I'm I yeah, yeah. given five I missed number two You've given five very very important points because when you look at the macro economy that is the national you see how we fit in there as women we stop ignoring I missed number two but you talked about child care I think it's something that is happening to make women especially in the workplace to stop feeling like they don't fit and especially when they get children so that they can still continue working because I think what maybe you've observed and one of the things that women use as an excuse not to take responsibilities because leadership comes with, with responsibilities it's raising children so people feel I have a child I can't go to become a leader or I can't take that managerial position because it demands exactly. a lot of my time and they they let that opportunity go because of their children workplaces are inventing places where mothers can be mothers and still work self-care it's important because a lot of women get overwhelmed in terms of work they forget themselves and you mentioned a very important thing in self-care you can't take care of others before you take care of yourself. Then the pursuit of happiness, and I think you explained so well that unless you are happy, you can't project that happiness. If you are sad, everybody around you will be feeling the same. So it's mm -hmm. important to look at all that. And also peace. That is really too much. <laughs> that is too much. I guess that is why you've always been a feminist and you not stop being a feminist, a mentor, a social justice leader and a woman's right. And I, I believe that sometimes it's good when you hear from somebody who is a mother, who is a wife, and who is still leading, because then whatever you feel is holding you back, stops holding you back. And I want to thank you, Drew, for having this opportunity to share. I knew we could still learn from you. I knew that what you have done could impact the people some people might not watch today, but I'm sure they will watch once it's on YouTube. I, I can see some people are struggling to get in. But thank you so, so much for the time. And we are to ask you to continue doing what you have been doing and to continue transforming other lives that you are transforming. Thank you.